The Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. I have said these things to you, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit fruit that will last, so the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. The Gospel of our Lord. Please pray with me. Holy God, I offer you these words and this time of sharing and learning for the sake of healing, healing our families, our city, our communities, our country, and our land. Give us courage to hear your words and open our hearts to you this morning, God. Amen. So as I said, I'm going to be preaching a sermon on the word, and then I'm going to invite Dick and Mary to share, and we're also going to show you a video. But let me start before we get, as we get into this story, and do another Bible quiz and ask you about the story of Jonah. Jonah, everyone know Jonah? Show of hands. Yes, I'm seeing some nods. Okay, the big fish. All right, so tell me, and you can put it in the chat too, or, or unmute if you want. What happens with Jonah? What happens? Yeah? By the whale. Yeah? And, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> God puts him in a timeout. Brandy said God puts him in a timeout. Well, so. Yeah, so God calls him. God gives him a great mission, and he responds by running away, right? Where does he run to when he runs away, before he gets eaten by the big fish? Does anybody remember where he goes? He goes to Joppa. He goes to the same seaport that's in our story this morning. And it makes sense because it's actually apparently a really ancient, very famous um, port on the Mediterranean Sea. But Jonah goes to Joppa, to this same seaport, where Simon Peter will be much, many, 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 many years later. Um, and Jonah runs away because he doesn't want to go to Nineveh, right? So he takes off on a boat to go to Tarshish instead. And he doesn't want to go to Nineveh because, why? He doesn't like preaching? He doesn't want the people to repent, right? God says, I'm going to save those people. I want you to go tell them. And Jonah's like, those? I'm not going to tell those people. If I tell them, they'll listen. And then where will we be? Right? Just so Joppa's a little famous as a place where people go to run away. We know this now, if we remember the story of Jonah. And yet here now, many, many years after Jonah's escapade, is Simon Peter, who visits his friend Simon the Tanner. Joppa's where Simon Peter has the vision about the clean and the unclean foods and realizes that he is being called, that Peter's being called, again, kind of like Jonah, to include some people that he did not think were originally on the God's mercy list. Mm -hmm. In Acts 10, verse 27, Peter, make, he makes it really plain if you read the scripture. He says, you know it's unlawful for me, a Jew, to associate with or visit you, 
but God showed me I should not call anyone profane or unclean. So I came here. And then he goes on in verse 34, I truly understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears and does what is right is acceptable to God. That phrase, God shows no partiality, literally means God doesn't pay attention to anyone's face. He's, he's not restricting anyone by the face. There's no facial recognition with God other than the one that says, yes, I claim you and you're my beloved. God's love isn't restricted. And so Peter's question that Jay read for us, can anyone withhold the water, echoes what we heard last week with the Ethiopian eunuch. What is to prevent me from being baptized? It's almost as if this, this message about God's mercy and love and forgiveness being for everyone is so important that we have to keep hearing it over and over, right? Jonah hears it and Peter hears it and we see it again and again in the Gospels. If God has called all people to hear the good news, then who are we to prevent them? And what is our call as church? You know where I'm going, like it's love one another, right? We get, the, <laughs> this is the message of the sermon. But let's slow down just a minute. And I think it's good to just reflect. Can you, can you think of a time um, when you experienced this sense of God's love being for everybody. I'm so aware that when Jesus gives them the commandment to love one another, um, it's not a Sermon on the Mount. It's at the Last Supper, right? I said that last week. This, this is all at the time when he knows, they don't know, but he knows that sorrow and sadness and heartbreak and death are coming for them. And so when he says love one another, it's in the context of knowing when, that their joy needs to be full because they're going to need it. It's in the context of being on the edge of death and yes, resurrection, but of everything changing. That's why he says, I, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. He wants them to know that he is calling them in to a journey of love that is bigger than anything they could ever imagine. And it is about their hearts. It's not just about the gospel and the spread of the gospel, but it starts with their receiving of Jesus's love. So when have you experienced being loved or welcomed or included by someone unexpectedly? And this could be a small moment. I invite you to think about it. If you're comfortable, maybe put a, a note or two in the chat as you hear me talking. I, thought on this for myself. When have I received, received God's love? Um, you know, I was always the fat kid that was picked last for dodgeball. Or not at all. Like, I don't, we don't see her on the, on the end of the line, you know? And I was really awkward and left out in school. And I think now they would call it bullying, but back then that hadn't been invented yet. It was just like, that's how school was. Um, and my, my school life kind of changed in middle school when someone invited me to their youth group. I had, been, I had grown up in church, but that youth group, when I think about being included in, I was, I was fat and I was awkward and I had goodwill clothes because, or clothes out of the dumpster, to be completely honest, because my family are immigrants. Um, and that wasn't cool back then. It was shameful. Um, church youth group was a place where I could be all of those things and fit in. It was a place where I belonged. And it wasn't, there wasn't even a question, you know? I was seen and I was loved just because I was there. Like, that's what church was for me. That's what I want it to be for our children and our grandchildren. What does it feel like to be brought in when you're on the outside? To be brought in when you're on the outside. Another example I can think of is when I was confirmed, I didn't grow up in the Episcopal Church, but I was confirmed in it. And the morning of my confirmation, um, the venue got changed at the last minute and it was a different church and a different priest. It was a woman who was a priest. I didn't even know they made them that way. 
and it was a round sanctuary. It was pink. They played conga drums for the doxology. It's hard to explain what it meant, but it felt like I had said, I had said yes to being confirmed because I had this call. And then when I got to the moment, it was like God just pulled out all the stops and was like, I see you, Elizabeth. I thought, what about all these other confirmands? Do they like pink and conga drums and a, a woman priest? Because I, I hope they're getting what they need, what they need. There were like 10 of us. But I just felt totally like, I belong, I'm chosen, more than I belong, I'm chosen. You know, I'm beloved. God knows me and is like, what can I give to Elizabeth to knock her socks off? So it will be unmistakable that I am calling her life and I'm calling her to serve me. The big revelation for Peter, as it was for Jonah, is that God chooses everybody. That's how big our God is. Now, the way that God loves me, it's not because I'm the special, amazing person. It's because God is the special, amazing God who can call and love that deeply, that specifically to every single one of us. And that's the Pentecost story that we're headed toward, right? That the wind and the flame is for all people, all tongues, all language. And if we can remember what it's like to be brought in from the outside, and to have our heart cracked open with like, like, I'm not worthy. Why did I get so lucky? Why did I get so much mercy and blessedness? Then I can't help but want that for others. If I can catch that vision. That's what it means that our joy may be complete. The fullness of joy. The fullness of joy. That's what we're called to be about. And I can't, I can't create that for you. I can pray it for you. And I can't create that for us as a church, but I am praying for it for us as a church. And we know that hmm, the process of love, if you're going to love, you have to be willing to have your heart broken, right? You have to be open. You have to be vulnerable. And we know as we think about Jonah, it's easy to poke fun at Jonah, but I mean, I ran away so many times from God. Someday, maybe if we have a coffee break or something, I can tell you all the times I ran away. And God forgives us. God doesn't let go of us. God keeps calling us back because God wants that fullness for us. So in the spirit of that grace and in the confidence of God's love for us, I want to invite Dick Bimrose to tell us a little bit about what he heard and learned about our Lutheran history, our Portland Lutheran history um, at Synod Assembly. And it's a story, I'll tell you, that is not easy to hear. And why do we want to hear it? We want to hear it because we want to be open and we want to be vulnerable to loving others. Because we know that's what we need as church to spread the gospel. That's the call. That's why it's that serious. So don't be like a Jonah. Just stick with Dick. You know Dick. He's, gonna, he's not going to lead you wrong. But listen to what he is going to share this morning. Go ahead, Dick. I'm going to go tell a little story about the area over around <clears throat> Emmanuel Hospital. And if you go over that way, I mean, over that way, at least two times a month when I go over the, to the Red Cross building. If you look around that area, you see the hospital and the buildings and the Senate office is there and there's a nice park and there's a lovely black church across the street. But it was built on a disaster for a group of people. This was a neighborhood where the was a black community where they were basically told that's where they had to live in the city of Portland. They had no choice. It was a pretty, it was a viable, amazing uh, community with schools and with children and with uh, parks and churches. And then the hospital decided it needed to expand size. And so the Portland city fathers came in and condemned the, prop the property, said, These, this is a blighted neighborhood. We need to, to condemn this property so that we can expand the, the hospital. Um, and this was all going on back in the time when I was growing up on the South Sea side of Portland off 122nd. And I, went, I did not remember ever hearing anything about this at all. So here's a whole group of people that were God's people as well as ours that were suddenly forced out of their homes to who knows where. And it's, 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 it's quite a sad ending. This was a Lutheran hospital and it was what happened. 
And so, Dick, when you heard the story about this thing that had happened, um, other than it being sad, was there some other way that, well, why did you think it was important for us to share the story this morning with the rest of the congregation? Because I think these are people that are, that have always been put on the outside edges of society. And these are the, these are the people that God especially likes to reach out to. I mean, it's in the, in the, in the gospel messages, if you look at the gospels, God is always reaching out to them. Jesus was always reaching out to that group of people, that, the forgotten, the unloved, the, the, those on the outside edges. And I think sometimes we forget that we too, uh, they, they are our part of our community. We need to find ways to bring them into the same community with us. Here's a video about that tells you a little bit more and maybe shows you the area so you can see what we're talking about. Everybody talks about gentrification as the movement of bodies. Gentrification is the movement of money. If you are not reversing economic conditions, you are not reversing gentrification. The people who came to Oregon brought particular racial mentalities and a racial agenda with them. Their basic approach to avoiding racial turmoil in Oregon was to try and make Oregon a place where only one race lived. In 1850, all the land of Oregon was given to one race to the exclusion of all other races. In that first generation, the people who received the land used that land to generate profit. They used those profits to generate political power, to insert themselves into the legislative machinery of the country. And the race-based affirmative action of that pioneer generation will reverberate through every succeeding generation in Oregon life. Real estate agents added to the concentration there by telling Negroes who asked for housing that there was only one place they could show them, Albina. If left alone, Portland would have had its West Coast Black Wall Street. My grandmother owned several properties, several businesses. Consistent with one of those earlier strategies of resistance to racial policies here, Blacks had always encouraged their community and individuals in the community to become homeowners. renewal was new. It was running amok. When it comes to the Emanuel Hospital expansion, Ira Keller was concerned with the high concentration of Black people in central Albina. And so he partnered with Emanuel Hospital and they started acquiring property between 1960 and 1970 without people knowing anything about it. You go to work, you come home, there's a note on your door telling you that you no longer own the home that you have been in, you raised your family in. You have 60 days to get out. If you need more time, you could then start paying rent on property you've owned for years. The explanation that was often given was that these were locations in which crime was rampant and which the uh, housing stock was blighted. Neither of those things were really true. But once you identify a community as crime-ridden and blighted, then that gives you at least ostensibly an excuse to destroy it, to eradicate it. A root shocky. That means you take me out of something where I was natively born at, or rooted at, and you put me in another environment. When you've been implanted in a pot where you don't want to be in the first place, you're going to have some resistance. When the larger community tells a smaller part of the community that it's necessary to move them from their homes, because the land is needed for progress, the total community has the obligation to see that those being displaced can be moved with dignity and without suffering financial loss. What we lost is wealth. 
You know, you can't give me you can't give me a, a acre and a mule when you know you took 18 away from me. Emmanuel Hospital never intended to develop certain parts of the land that was demolished. And that's clearly stated in a historic document. The three blocks at Emmanuel South Campus must remain available for future residential development. That essentially says that Emmanuel Hospital, PDC, Portland Housing Authority, the city of Portland, would restore every home that was demolished within close proximity of the Emmanuel Urban Renewal Area. That never happened. We want to stop this vote so that we can have a real and adequate report on the specifics of what will be built and developed there, but we want to make sure that everyone is well aware that the agreement and the allocation was to build affordable homes by Emmanuel. If we look around the nation today, we know that many of those neighborhoods that were renewed didn't really need to be renewed. They just needed to be protected and they just needed to be cared for. Develop the site, please. But please do not bulldoze and rush through resolutions in a closed door process organized around the needs of private and public institutions represented in this collaborative project. This is how we got here in the first place. In the late 60s and early 70s, I was teaching at Mount Tabor School. At that time, the middle school in Albina was closed and all the students were bused out to different schools. And so they were separated from their friends, they were separated from their siblings. <clears throat> um, it made the school day longer for these students. It made it so that they weren't home in the afternoon early enough to help take care of their little brothers and sisters. It also made it, <clears throat> excuse me, it also made it difficult for their parents. If there was a program going on at school, if the child got sick at school, it made it difficult for the parent to get over there. Whereas before they could just have the student walk home or they could just walk to the school. Um, a decade or two later, Albina opened a new middle school, Harriet Tubman. And Kids went back to their community. However, the community was not the same. It had been disrupted so much by having the school closed and having the families and communities disrupted. I read a couple of days ago that part of one of the plans for the expansion of the freeway at um, the Rose Quarter may mean moving Harriet Tubman Middle School somewhere else. It just keeps on going, it keeps on going. And in closing, I ask you to consider what would have been like for you if your kids had been moved far away from your school, you could not, you could not easily get to them. Um, they could not easily get to you if they were sick. It, it's just one insult after another that our community has, has happened. So please think about what this kind of thing would have meant to you and what it has meant to this community of Albina. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. And I think that question about what would it have been like for us if that had happened to our family, to people who looked like us, to our community, I think is an important one because it's a heavy story, right? Our first reaction is to, is to, my first reaction is to draw away and think it happened a long time ago. Um, it wasn't our church that did it in the sense of it wasn't Gethsemane's church. 
and what, why? What's the point of, of, of looking at this painful, this painful past, maybe? Dick had asked a question as we were watching that video. He said, well, where did those people go? And the answer is they went here. They went to East Portland. They came to Mill Park and Cherry Park and Hazelwood and Russellville and Park Rose and Lentz. That, that's, th these are our neighbors. And so as we look around and we see houselessness and we see the struggle for working families, we remember that we are all in this together, right? I'm not bringing us this story to guilt us or shame us. I'm bringing it because in order for us to have, um, in order for us to be open to the movement of the Holy Spirit, this is where there is work to do. This is where there is healing that needs to take place. This is, this is actually the good news, right? The good news is that when you are involved in despair and oppression and destructiveness, and you follow a God who forgives and loves and saves, you can find wholeness and healing. But we only get there if we're willing to be uncomfortable and to look at our own connections to our neighbors, the neighbors around us. Why do people struggle? Why is there a loss of wealth? And it's because of this, it's directly because of this. So the good news is as Mary said, we can imagine, we're all human, we can imagine what it would feel like and we can imagine the anger we would feel and what we would need for restitution and the sense of mistrust and disconnection we would have with white folks and maybe even with Lutherans if this was part of our family history. So we can connect because we are all human and we can trust in a God who forgives and a God who gives second chances, and a God who's full of abundant and overflowing mercy, as we remember this morning. I believe that God shows us what we need in order to live out the gospel. It's not an accident that the Synod brought us this video and that Dick said, hey, I, I give blood there twice a month. I know that area, right? Or that Mary said, I know those school kids. These are the neighbors that we are called to love, and this is part of our work as Gethsemane. So let us, let us pray together. Holy God, we give you this story and all of our feelings about it, whether we are disappointed or frustrated or angry or heartbroken, we give all of that to you right now. And we ask you to hold us as your people, as faithful Lutheran seekers of your grace, who have always wanted to do your work in the world and yet have made mistakes at times. Forgive us, God, for the mistakes that we have made and show us a way forward. You have promised forgiveness when we repent and restoration when we turn to you. So help us to see a way to love our neighbors and to allow ourselves to be so overwhelmed with your love for us that we cannot help but live our lives in service to you. We give you the thanks and the praise and the glory, God. Amen.